Belgium heads for a political record. 16 months without an official government. On the 30th of September 2020, the country of Belgium made headlines when it finally managed to form a government. This fixed the record for the longest time that any developed nation has spent without a functioning government at 652 days, smashing the previous record of 589 days being also Belgium. So why is it that this otherwise stable country can't form a government? Why is Belgium so messed up? Belgium. 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 In 2018, Belgium did have a government led by Charles Michel and made up of these four parties. However, later that year, a right-wing nationalist group called the NVA left over a disagreement about a United Nations Pact on Immigration, because, you know, nationalism. This left the government without a working majority, meaning that no new legislation could be passed until a government was formed. To understand why Belgium experiences the issues it does today, it's important to have a brief understanding of its history, which can be largely summarised by this clip. Don't make any sudden moves. Mine. In the 15th century, modern-day Belgium and the Netherlands were ruled by the Spanish King Philip II and were collectively known as Belgica Regia. Philip was a Catholic and enforced his religion across the entire region. This caused a lot of discontent in the mostly Protestant North and led to a period called the Dutch Revolution. In 1588, the north of Philip's territory gained their independence and formed the Dutch Republic, while the southern Catholic region remained under his control. For the next few centuries, this region was fought over by the French, Dutch, <coughs> British, Spanish and Austrians. After the defeat of Napoleon in 1814, there was a conference of the major European powers where it was decided that the nations would be combined into a united kingdom of the Netherlands. This was ruled by the Protestant King William I. William's rule was deeply unpopular in the Catholic South of the new nation. In 1830, this finally boiled over with riots popping up all over modern-day Belgium. Finally, in 1830, Belgium was internationally recognised as an independent state at the Conference of London. This division over religious as well as linguistic lines has led to Belgium being the very fractured nation that it is today, with three separate geographic regions of Flanders, Wallonia and Brussels, and three separate language communities of Dutch, French and German. The root of much of Belgium's political problems comes from the fact that during national elections most parties only run in one of its regions so you end up with groups of similar parties that differ along language lines. For instance, you have a French Socialist Party and a Flemish Socialist Party, a French Liberal Party and a Flemish Liberal Party, a French Green Party and a Flemish Green Party. On top of this, just to add another level of diversity to its political landscape, Belgium also elects its government using a system called Proportional Representation, or PR. I've covered PR in previous videos, so I'll just give a quick rundown. Unlike the UK, where one party can form a majority based off of a third of the vote, in Belgium, if one party gets 10% of the votes, they get 10% of the seats, and so on. People often use Belgium as an argument against PR, but let's just be clear, it is not. The point that's often made is that Belgium demonstrates how PR would lead to constant, unstable coalition governments. But as you can see, there are numerous other factors that lead to Belgium's instability. In fact, according to the Fragile States Index, the top five most stable countries in the world all use PR. So that's how Belgium works on a national level. But on a local level, things get even crazier. Remember those geographic regions and language communities that I mentioned earlier? Well, between them, they have a total of five separate parliaments. First, there are the linguistic parliaments, so you have the French-speaking parliament, the German-speaking parliament, and the Dutch parliament representing both the Dutch-speaking community and the Flanders region. Then overlapping this, you have the Wallonia regional parliament and the Brussels regional parliament. So depending on where you live, you could be represented by up to four different parliaments. A French-speaking family in Brussels could depend on the central government for granddaddy's pensions, on the French community government for the music academy, the Dutch community government for the children's school, the Brussels government for the garbage recycling, and so on. 
So what does all this complexity mean for Belgians? Is it like the purge with fighting in the streets and no law enforcement? Well, sadly not. For day-to-day -day life, everything largely goes on the same, with all the old laws being enforced and last year's budget being rolled forwards. All this was overseen by what's called a caretaker government, which was led by Sophie Wellms. This wasn't too problematic and everything was bumping along okay until 2020 when coronavirus hit, at which point Belgium's lack of governance proved deadly. Coronavirus tsunami. Cases there saw. The hotspot of the continent. To date, they have reported a death toll of 2,175 per million people. This is a rate 30% higher than the average for the European Union and 14% higher than the UK. Woo! Go Britain! We're officially not the worst. I mean, Belgium had no government. What's our excuse? We were hard, hard work. Oh, oh yeah. Things got so bad that Doctors Without Borders had to intervene and reported that care homes had become places to die rather than places to live and that residents and staff had been abandoned to their fates. That same report went on to stress that the causal factors behind Belgium's response was that the Belgium health and social care system is incredibly complex with nine separate health ministers. There was even one incident where 26 residents of a care home died of COVID shortly after a visit by an infected Sinterklaas, or as he's known to the rest of the world, racist Santa. Jesus, how is this still a thing? So how did this record-breaking impasse finally come to an end? After 652 days, a government was finally formed of the so-called Vivaldi coalition, made up of these seven political parties. The coalition is led by Alexander de Croo of the Open VLD party. For anyone that's even tried finding a night that seven of their mates are available to watch a movie, I'm sure you can appreciate what a big achievement this was. Given all this instability, is it even likely that Belgium will survive as a nation? The two largest parties in the national Belgium government are both Flanders separatist parties, who collectively achieved 43% of the vote in Flanders. A recent poll showed that 37% of the Flemish would vote for independence if given the chance, opposed to only 14% of Walloons. This disparity isn't surprising given that the GDP per capita is about 30% lower in the south. So what's next for Belgium? Well, I guess only time will tell, but I'll be sure to make a video about it on the next development. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing, and I'd love to hear your thoughts for a future video in the comments down below.